And so, as for me, I sing now of the light that is Agiro's. Bright I see it as the very suns which the same Agiro now invokes to shine upon us. And yet neither praise nor blame can I give at all to such as she without offense to our splendid leader, who herself appears as preeminent as would a well-knit steed of ringing hoof that overcomes in the race if he were set to graze among the unsubstantial cattle of our dreams that fly. See you not first that the courser is of anetic blood, and secondly that the tresses that bloom upon my cousin Hagasikura are like the purest gold? And as for her silver face, how shall I put it to you in express words? Such is Hagasikura, and yet she whose beauty shall run second not unto hers, but unto Agido's, shall run as coarser Colaxian, to pure Ibenian bread, for as we bear along her robe to Orthia, these our doves rise to fight for us amid the ambrosial night, not as those heavenly doves, but brighter, aye, even as Sirius himself. Oh, hi, hello, and welcome to one of the last episodes in this epic series on the wild world of ancient Sparta. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I am your host, Liv, the woman who desperately hates how often she has to use the word baby to describe her career, but who also could probably never bring herself to change the name of the podcast, and thus, here we are. And I am rambling, as I am wont to do. Originally, I had planned for this series to feature just four narrative episodes, that is, episodes where I'm just the one talking to you, the Tuesday style. And then, uh, gods, they all ended up being like 2,000 words longer than any of my typical scripts, and even then I was feeling like we weren't fitting in everything that we needed to. <laughs> Turns out when you turn to history for a special series, rather than uh, an ancient island whose entire issue is that it actually wasn't even a myth, well, the amount of content you have to present to the listeners is considerably different from uh, the usual. And thus, here we are with another episode on Sparta. Today, we are talking women, because of course we're talking women. And not just because I am me and I prefer to look at the stories of women in the ancient world, but because Spartan women were quite a bit different from the women we know of in the rest of the ancient Greek world. And simultaneously, they weren't quite as different as they're often seen today. I touched upon it in that first Sparta episode, but while women of Sparta had a bit more freedom, probably enjoyed their lives a bit more than others, primarily Athens, which is where we have the rest of our information, a feminist utopia, Sparta was not. The quote I read at the top of this episode was from a lyric poet called Alcman, and he was probably, or maybe, Spartan. He was also one of the few sources that we have where there's any level of certainty that he was Spartan, and thus he's one of the very few quote-unquote official Spartan sources. I did mention him in the intro episode because, of course, we always want Spartan sources, but as a lyric poet, Alcman doesn't really provide us with much history. Except when he did. Now, this poem is about women taking part in a festival, a song and dance. Next Friday, I'll actually be having a guest on the show to talk about this exact poem, Alcman's first Parthenion. So we'll learn a bit more about him and this poetry later. For now, it's a real ancient source talking about real ancient women. And that in itself is kind of a thrill. This is episode 198. Things were marginally better for them. The women of Sparta. So, like, 
three weeks ago now, I gave you all a brief introduction to women in Sparta. It has been a minute since that little intro, and I've thrown endless more Spartan knowledge at you all, so we're going to recap some bits of that. That's going to help you, and also me, if I'm being honest, because this series is taking my brain down from the inside. We talked about what the roles that women played in Sparta were exactly, what their purpose was in life, what was expected of them, and we briefly touched upon the pretty broadly held idea that Spartan women had more freedom than their Athenian counterparts. I hated breaking your bubble then, and I hate to break it now, but once again, ancient Greek women, no matter what polis they were from, were still women living in an ancient and deeply patriarchal society. Spartan women were still expected to make little Spartan babies and take care of the children, at least while they were still at home. And, like, I don't want to phrase that and suggest that we don't currently still live in a patriarchal society, because we do. But it's one that's at least had some minor changes made, so that women can, you know, do a lot of things, even if we don't get paid the same or have the same rights to our bodies, among literally countless other issues still facing women and gender nonconforming people today. But... (laughs) With all of that said, life for women in Sparta wasn't quite as oppressive as we may be used to seeing. And isn't that lovely? The bar. It is in the ground. They didn't expect their women to just hide away in a room their whole life. Women were allowed to go outside and feel the sun on their faces, the grass between their toes, and to run. Oh, they were allowed to run. Oh man, there's that old exercise thing again. The Spartans were the gym rats of ancient Greece. They'd be the ones taking all the selfies and filming TikToks of them doing any old thing in the gym. Because impressive, strong. But yes, Spartan women were expected to exercise, to keep themselves fit, to make sure they were healthy. Healthy enough to keep making strong Spartan baby boys. But the point remains, they were allowed to do some things. Because ultimately, this focus on the physical body really did have more to do with the whole making babies thing. Xenophon tells us that Lycurgus believed that if the mother and father were strong, then the baby would be strong. Which, I mean, I guess is a fair enough assumption. But once again, as one might expect in ancient Greece, a woman's value is directly tied to her ability to have children. Wonderful. Regardless, baby makers or not, there is enough known about women of ancient Sparta that I can dedicate an entire episode to what their lives might have been like, and what unique privileges or hardships they might have had, and frankly, that is a thrill in itself. In that first episode, we talked a little bit about what women's education looked like. While there were not many sources on what the girls' education program actually looked like, next to nothing compared to the agoge, we can find little slivers of information here and there. The boys' education, that agoge, was state-run. That's what made it so unique in the ancient Greek world broadly. This was a Spartan-run system that required attendance, among other things. We don't know this to be the case for the girls' education. It, It seems like they were expected to get together with other girls to at least take part in some kind of group education program. What we do know for sure is that, once again, it heavily featured exercise. Spartan girls were expected to get out there and run, wrestle, roll around. Could that mean more than the people who've interpreted it wanted to mean? I mean, maybe. I could see it. Plutarch explains the reasoning for this as, like, not that not only did it give the women an excitement about sport, but it also gave them, and this is Plutarch's words, not mine, quote, a taste of noble high-mindedness, since they were participating no less than the men in the pursuit of excellence and honor. Great. The condescension is so real. But aside from the heavy influence of exercise, we do also know that there was an explicit culture of women and girls taking part in singing and dancing competitions. They were heavily involved in the broader culture of sharing poetry, songs, and dance, which was in itself one of the biggest and most important aspects of Spartan culture. And the ladies were allowed not only to be there and to watch these things, but to actually be a part of them. This is hugely different from what we know for certain about the women of Athens, for example. Probably there were women in Athens who had more freedom than we know, for sure. It couldn't have been quite as strict as the evidence tells us, but the evidence is broadly that even the largest festivals of theater, song, and dance usually excluded women in Athens. At least women of a certain stature. Women who counted as, like, official people. They were, the men were probably allowed to have their heteri there, their sex workers, their companions. But fancy Athenian wives? Nah, they're staying home. But not in Sparta. 
Poets like Alkman, who, like I said, will feature in an entire conversation episode next week, gives us glimpses of what this might have looked like. This musique, or the, the choral song and dance, was deeply tied to ritual. These choral groups were probably linked closely to cult and ritual activity, and just as you would expect to see a boys' or a men's choral group at a festival, you were sure to see a women's choral group too. I hate that the bar is so low that this is seriously cool and exciting, but here we are. It appears that this would remain a major part of women's lives, too. A woman would be tied to this specific choral group where she trained and performed with other girls in similar life stages. From what we can tell, these women stayed in these groups throughout their lifetime. These choral groups really parallel the men's cystion, that practice of spending a huge amount of your time with other Spartan men, in that they provided the women with support from the other women throughout the entirety of their lives, like a girl group from the 90s, but they don't tragically break up and go their separate ways. Athenian women would almost certainly form their own groups of women in similar situations. But when it comes to Sparta, we have evidence of it as a cultural practice, like a tradition, rather than something done of one's own accord just to say, stay sane and happy, which I am certain the Athenian women did. We just might not know about it in the same way. But these traditional choral groups of women weren't just about cultural tradition, but religion, too. These choral groups provided the women of of ancient Sparta with a space for them to participate in cult rituals, specifically related to Helen and Artemis. This is a really long-standing tradition, too. Throughout our knowledge of ancient Sparta, we know that these choral competitions and traditions also revolved around cult worship and ritual, which generally just fits in with how the ancient Greeks did things. Almost everything was typically related to cult worship in some way, but this one involves ladies. Thrilling. It's also still a bit uncertain. (laughs) Surprise, surprise. But let's look at what we do know, and the theories, because Helen, whew. For all the poor woman has been given, like, the famous name of Helen of Troy, she was, as you all well know after listening to me rant and rave about this so many times, she was Helen of Sparta. And what with her being originally Helen of Sparta and eventually returning to that same title, she had an enormous presence in Sparta. and She was a major figure in their local religion. There aren't a lot of mortals who get this kind of treatment, and it's both fascinating and absolutely thrilling that a woman gets a status like that. I mean, fine, she's the daughter of Zeus with all the swan nonsense, but she is still an otherwise mortal woman who is treated like a goddess in Sparta. The main shrine to Helen was called the Menelion. Yes, I know, it's not even named for her. It was named after her husband and primarily dedicated to him. But it was also probably actually built over a much older temple that was primarily dedicated to Helen herself. You can take that as depressing, because it is, or we can just focus on the idea that she was still wildly important and had a shrine to her in the most important temple of Sparta. We have to take what we can get. On the plus side, it does appear that Helen was worshipped separately from Menelaus. It wasn't all about him or him being her husband. So there is our win. She was important and existed as a separate entity entirely from her husband. Wow, what a concept. Helen was, as you might imagine, seen as an ancestor of the whole city. The women of Sparta were descended from this beautiful woman of myth. Ultimately, though, her cult seems to be a really old one with uncertain origins. While we know of the Queen Helen, the one who was blamed for that decade-long war, even though she had absolutely zero say in any of the matters. Yeah, so there's this famous Homeric Helen, this Helen of the Trojan War. And then there's like this other Helen, a more specifically goddess-like Helen. And in Sparta, she was as old as the trees. The Menelion, this temple that I was talking about, it's located in an area called Therapne. And Helen is seen as a cult figure so heavily tied to that area. She is so tied to that area that it is very possible that she was, at some point in Spartan history, combined with a different 
older goddess. This other Helen is more of this explicit goddess figure, and her name appears on shrines more often because we have this name of this older, more nature-based Helen, and it's Helen Dendritus. She's a tree-based goddess. This general concept, which we're going to go into more, is one of my favorite things when it comes to learning about ancient Greece. Like, People were alive and thriving in that area for so many centuries and even millennia that often gods and goddesses get combined together to make new altered deities that fit the changes that took place in those regions. And this is particularly true when it comes to women, often because the regions originally like way, way, way back might have worshipped a mother goddess more prominently than they actually worshipped men. One of the most common art forms that we have from the early Bronze Age and before that are these goddess figurines. I wish I remembered more about them, but I wrote this whole paper on these prehistoric goddess figurines back in university and it totally changed my life. In the old days, they were probably a more matriarchal society, worshipping women for their contributions to fertility and the earth before, you know, men came in to take over and decided to fuck a bunch of shit up. But for all they fucked shit up, we can see the remnants of this earlier time through these kinds of conflations and the evolution of goddesses. Like, specifically, this Helen Dendritus, this older, more nature and earth-based version of the famed Helen of Sparta. So let's talk about these associations with nature that are inherent in this cult of Helen in Sparta. Now, she is still Helen, so the ideas of beauty and femininity that we might think of her, of this more famous Homeric character, they're there, but the cult of Helen has more ties with nature than other cults of the region. This Helen Dendritus is connected closely with the land, she's shown dancing beside the river Eurotas. There's this alternate version of her separate from the Trojan War, and there we find her existing as something else entirely, a Spartan nature goddess. In this version of Helen that better connects with the fertility aspects that are seen in the cult of Helen, so she's now tied with like the fertility of the earth, the Eurotas River, and the region itself. Basically, she's just so... So, so much more than the Helen who was carried off to Troy. And fertility is one of her most important qualities when it comes to worship and ritual. Not least because fertility is a seriously important thing in a world where ancestry and inheritance plays a major role in what it means to actually be a Spartan. One thing that's common with other nature and fertility goddesses is their actual role as a mother in stories, like think Demeter. But I'm not sure it's fair to say that about this Helen of myth. She had one daughter, Hermione, but her role as a mother wasn't the most important thing about her. In storytelling, Hermione mostly serves as a means of reuniting the regions of Sparta and Argos or Mycenae, or rather keeping them connected, at least in the surviving sources. Hermione marries Orestes, her cousin, keeping all that royal lineage in the family. But her relationship with her mother, Helen, is it's somewhat secondary. But again, there's this issue of the surviving sources that we have are not Spartan. And so probably the Spartans had this whole other thing connecting these goddesses or connecting Helen to her own nature-based fertility. But these two distinct versions of Helen being combined into the one that makes up this Helen that we see in cult worship, it just basically it makes more sense to have these combinations. Because there, the Helen who caused the war just isn't the point. Honestly, it's a it's a seriously complex concept, and Bettany Hughes wrote an entire and enormous book about Helen and who she was, where she came from, how she evolved, how many different ex- versions of Helen existed in the ancient world and beyond. But right now, I'm personally just obsessed with the idea that Helen was only beloved and respected, and that they all just kind of chose to ignore the Trojan War of it all. I think that says a lot about Spartan culture versus the more famous Homeric tradition. We often think the Homeric stories were kind of like the be all and end all, but the truth is that they weren't always that in the regions tied to the Homeric tradition that survives for us today. Like Sparta might've had this whole other 
version than the one that we know. As for Helen as a character and her complexity, I've been trying to talk about her in detail, but there's a two-part episode that you can listen to if you want even more about her mythological, less Spartan-specific stories. It's from a year or two back now. Here today, we are interested in this nature Helen, this fertility Helen, the one whose cult included women and girls of Sparta singing and dancing and just, I imagine, like, being happy young women in the ancient world. with that, we are back at the choral dancing. Now, one of the things that's going to come up in my conversation on Alchemin is that we actually don't know for certain that this specific competition of women singing and dancing that he's singing about was tied to the cult of Helen. It's equally likely, or perhaps more so, that it was linked with the cult of Artemis that was also enormous in Sparta. But today we're more concerned with the cult of Helen broadly. So we're talking about her today, but when it comes to this poem, it's uncertain. My guest next week will talk all about it. I won't try to recall everything now. But regardless of who exactly they they were most aligned with in these practices, we get to hear about these groups of women that would sing and dance around and all in relation to a specific cult of worship. So we know that cultural practices of groups of young women singing and dancing were important in Sparta. And we know that there was specifically practices of singing and dancing that were connected with the cult around Helen, which again is what we're concerned with today. Because like I said last week, the Spartans really just love to sing and dance. (laughs) But why singing and dancing? Well, different scholars have different opinions on why this is. Some think it has to do with the connections to some sort of nature goddess, with the dancing and singing reflective of agricultural practices. And before you get hung up on this not sounding like Artemis, remember that while many of the storytelling sources that survive present the gods as like specifically aligned with really specific things, they often had vastly different roles across regions. The complexities of the gods and what they did and did not represent in any individual polis truly cannot be undersold. They all, in their own way, were capable of representing almost anything. Just depended on where you were, who you worshipped, and why. Ultimately, it's another example of don't trouble yourselves with trying to wrap your head around fitting it in with our existing stories. That isn't the point. The point simply is the goddess herself. Either this Artemis, who may have been reflected in the singing and dancing, or, in our case, Helen, who appears to have been associated with nature and these cultural practices of the singing and the dancing. I've said that too many times now. In the case of Helen, some think it harkens back to the very early stories of her in Sparta, where she would dance along the banks of the river Eurotas. Spartan girls are often connected to Helen in this way. Like, both the act itself and its connections with Helen was what made the girls Spartan. It's kind of lovely. Euripides, my (laughs) beloved, has one of his choruses mention these Spartan girls dancing around with Helen. And another poet I haven't mentioned yet, Theocritus, who was born in the Hellenistic period, he wrote a number of pieces compiled into what we call the idols. And and one of these is the Epithamalium, a, a marriage song for Helen. And I guess for Menelaus, too. He was technically there. But it was about Helen, about the woman. <laughs> Just like this episode is about the women. For the women. I'm sad I even had to mention Menelaus as often as I have. The song, being a marriage song for the two, progresses as one might expect a song that's meant to be sung to newlyweds might progress. It's all good and fun. Lots of talk about how absolutely stunning Helen is and how lucky Menelaus should feel, and he should. But we get to an interesting bit about a group of young girls, maidens, teenagers probably, who are dancing along the Rotas River. Apparently, Helen used to join these girls in these dances, but in this song, now that she's married, she can't anymore. She has to, I don't know, she has wifely duties or something. So now these girls, these friends of Helen, they don't get to spend the time they once got to with her, and they're mourning this loss. They collect flowers and make a wreath, which then they all will hang. 
on a tree where everyone can see and be reminded of Helen and her beauty and trees. <laughs> now, I know my first reaction to this is going to be sad, like to think about how women just had to become wives and mothers no matter what they wanted. But obviously, things were also just different then. And this was just about a transition in Helen's life. Things change. People grow. The song is about Helen, but it's also a practice in every young woman's life, that tra transition into adulthood, into marriage. It was comforting for the women going through it, this reminder that they weren't alone, that this was all part of a process, a, a process that even Helen herself went through. Which very naturally brings us to the topic of marriage in ancient Sparta. <laughs> Honestly, transitioning these topics through history episodes is the hardest part. So finding a natural progression, oh, it's a real thrill. Now, there's a couple things to go through when it comes to marriage in ancient Sparta. For one, as I've already mentioned in the introductory episode, Spartan girls married later than their Athenian counterparts. And we are fucking proud of them for that. In Athens, girls got married around the ages of 14 to 16. Ugh. While in Sparta, they were more commonly getting married at like 18 to 19. So already we are off to a good start. <laughs> now, to be fair, we don't know what the standard age was for girls in the rest of ancient Greece because of those damn sourcing issues. But at the least, we can compare Athens to Sparta in this respect. What matters is Sparta, though, and at Sparta, they chose to marry their daughters off when they were a little bit older. And they married them off to men that were not as far apart in age from them, which is also a bonus. Now, the details of these marriages are unclear. We have an account from Plutarch that the women would have their heads shaved and the men would make a show of pretending to abduct them. But like a fun abduction? One where both parties are aware of what's happening, but are going along with it consensually? Or as consensually as can be when the women are still being uh, married off to whoever their father wanted. Again, we take what we can get. This is also something I've heard in previous research or, or maybe a conversation episode. I've learned too many things. But it does directly connect with the, the stories of the gods abducting women. Stories which we, we see as horrific now, but weren't inherently seen that way in the ancient world. So while I want to remind you that things we learn from Plutarch must be taken with a whole fuck ton of grains of salt, this is something that I do believe appears elsewhere and does definitely make some sense in a more ritualistic sense. Whether it was widespread practices or where is another question entirely. So what did married life look like for Spartan women? Well, I mean, the men were expected to hang out with their pals in the Sistion like 24-7 until they were like 30 or so. So they just weren't around. There's some talk about how the men were expected to like maybe sneak out in the middle of the night to go meet their wives to, to you know, do it up, get that baby making business over and done with so that he can go back and hang out with his bros again 24-7. Just bros. Mm -hmm. Definitely platonic bros. All of them. Still, it's not about them. But when it came to their wives, there's this hope that pregnancy would still happen. They did want that. And they also wanted to foster this ability to essentially be like without, to go without their wives. It's all about loyalty to the state over anything else. That is Sparta. Regardless, this meant that if a woman were to get pregnant, as she most likely would, she was probably going to have to raise that baby by herself. That's if the baby survived. I'm sure most of them did not. But regardless, it was her responsibility. Women handled raising those children that were so fucking important, but the women weren't half as important themselves. What a fair and just system. Kind of familiar. So yeah, while the husband is off spending all of his time with his platonic bros, the mother was responsible for raising the children, at least until the boys turned seven and they pranced off to the agoge. And then eventually the husbands are able to move back home and live out the rest of their days with their wives. It's, it's a whole practice. It's confusing. Uh, Xenophon also notes something interesting, that there wasn't as much emphasis on who someone's father really was, and instead that actually all of the men in Sparta are kind of in a position to act as father figures to the children. 
that in a way the children were to understand that like all male adult Spartans were in some way responsible for raising them. Which leads us directly into the practice that was mentioned in last week's conversation episode. Wife swapping, or perhaps more widely known as plural marriages. You see, they had a system where if one woman was, I don't know, particularly good at having children, another man could see if she would be down for having one of his kids. Or if a man decides that he wants to live without a wife, what a concept. I wonder why that might be. Uh, Anyway, he's still in need of, of keeping that Spartan line going. So he could see if another Spartan woman would be okay with just burying him a kid or two, maybe a bunch. Or it's possible like a bunch of brothers don't want their family property to be divided up. So they all just get down and they all get in with one woman. For all their kids. So now the property just like stays in the family. (laughs) It does actually seem like women had to agree to this, which is cool. It's not like a husband could just say, hey, you know, Jason down the street. Yeah. Old bachelor never wanted to have a wife. Yeah. He needs a kid, but he needs someone to do it. Oh, yeah. I volunteered you. Isn't that fun? Anyway, like apparently that's not how it went. So that's cool. Uh, The woman actually did need to be down with the whole situation. And this actually helps the whole inheritance issue in a couple of ways. Because, you see, like, women in Sparta inherited when their parents died. Yes. Cool, right? They could own property and they could have their own wealth and they weren't just holding on to it for their husbands or for their firstborn sons or whatever. Legally, daughters were entitled to a part of their parents' estates. Not the same amount as the sons, that would be ridiculous, but a little bit. It's believed that this is actually how women became to be the holders of significant amount of land in Sparta, something that ancient authors seemed like a little bit torn about how they should feel. That's fine. They're dead now. And again, this did come up in the conversation episode, but it's so fucking fascinating and related to women. So we're talking about it again. So these rules, they account for this really interesting thing about Sparta. And that is that uterine half siblings were allowed to marry each other. Yeah, basically, if you were half siblings, but it was like the mother that you shared, you were allowed to get married to your other half sibling. I imagine it's because they figured like maybe women contributed less DNA or I mean, they didn't know what DNA was, but something to that effect. But then also Athens appeared to have like the opposite rule where you could share a dad, but not a mom. I don't know. But because there are different levels of wealth in Sparta, you better you'd want wealthy families to be marrying other wealthy families and not those of lesser means, which is how we get this like sibling marriage. (laughs) And this feels like a fine time to remind you that one of the major things that contributed to Sparta's decline in the ancient world is that their population was so strict and regimented that eventually all the rules required to be an official Spartan citizen meant that the actual citizenry, the number of people there, officially Spartan, just dwindled and dwindled. And, you know, maybe the practice of marrying half-siblings could have contributed to that population decline. Who's to say? (laughs) Still, half-sibling marriage aside, I want to emphasize this because it is unique. Spartan women had the ability to hold a great amount of wealth and even power in terms of their ability to create the heirs. And they held real status and and power again in their time. So to bring back to what I was sharing with all of you in this first Spartan episode, while Spartan women weren't treated in any kind of like revolutionary way, like they didn't have equality and it certainly wasn't a feminist or matriarchal place, but they did have a lot more power and clout and freedom than in Athens. And that's pretty damn nice. And finally, because frankly, this episode has gone on long enough. I hope it made sense. I get a little rambly with these history ones. Whew. I want to leave you all with the story of one historical Spartan woman. Her name was Kiniska, and she was the sister of the king at the time. She was wealthy, which was, as one might expect, the easiest way of being a woman capable of making waves at the time. Uh, Money and status was influential and the main contributor to privilege. Weird, I know. Regardless, we love a woman. Still, we love a woman making a name for herself that has lasted almost 2,500 years. 
So, you see, in 396 BCE, Kaniska was the first woman to ever win a victory at the Olympics. That's right. It was not Cassandra, but this fine woman, Kaniska. And actually, well, uh, we will get to why it really wasn't Cassandra. <laughs> and how did Kaniska manage this historical and downright badass win at the Olympics? See, so women weren't actually allowed to compete in the Olympics. That is the key. No, they couldn't have their women out there exposing themselves in such a way. And actually, I didn't mean the fact that the Greeks did all their Olympic competing naked, but that works too. No, just for all for so many reasons, not least because Athens was also part of this, women were not allowed there. And since I mentioned Cassandra, this is actually one of the like the main ahistorical moment in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, or one of them. She wins in the Olympics. And also there's a storyline simultaneously about how a woman isn't even allowed to watch the Olympics. It's a bit contradictory there, but they gave Cassandra a win at the Olympics, so we will forgive them. <laughs> what matters here for uh, those of you who do not obsessively play Assassin's Creed Odyssey is this Kaniska. See, she wasn't allowed to compete at the Olympics because she was a woman, but she really wanted to win. And she found a loophole. The chariot races that took place during the Olympics were the one competition where it wasn't actually the charioteers, the people steering, the people officially competing that won in the Olympics. It was whoever owned the horses and the chariot that they were driving. And so, in 396 BCE, Kaniska had her horses and her chariot entered in to the four-horse chariot race, and those horses won, which meant our girl Kaniska also won the Olympics. Good for her. Oh, nerds, nerds, nerds. Thank you so much for listening. This is technically the last episode of my Spartan series, and I cannot tell you how much I've enjoyed diving into the history, speaking with these experts, so much more. Uh, that said, this episode was also finalized very last minute, and so Michaela has not had a chance to listen back before it's getting released. So I hope I made sense. Uh, these history ones make it a little more difficult for me to ensure that I am actually making sense. But here we are. As for long term, I do want to ensure that the show remains primarily Greek mythology because it, it is my life source. But having a touch of history now and then, and of course, all my incredible guests covering history really just adds so much to our understanding of the mythology. Like the more we understand the actual world of ancient Greece, the more we can understand where their stories and their myths are actually coming from. All to say, don't expect things to change too much too regularly, but I do love history now and then. That said, we're not entirely finished with Sparta. On Friday, you're going to hear me speaking with none other than Natalie Haynes about her new book, Stone Blind, featuring Medusa, so that's fucking incredible and not related to Sparta. But on Saturday, I have a bonus episode that I recorded with Michaela, the woman who is the real reason the Sparta series was capable of existing. Michaela did so much research and writing, helping me write scripts and everything among, among cult, countless other things. I cannot speak. So we just chatted about the, the general process in this behind the scenes episode. It's a casual, fun conversation. We just thought a bit of fun behind the scenes could add to everyone's appreciation of the series. But then the following Friday, we are tossing in another kind of extra conversation because since the, the series started, I heard from Julia Peroni, who has the classically trained podcast and who had lots of fascinating things to say about the poet Alcman and that particular poem that I read at the top of this episode, the first Parthenion. So because of that, we have a bit more coming. Now, as for a Q&A, I haven't gotten many questions from you all and I'm going to take that to mean that I just presented such a detailed and coherent series that you have nothing more to ask but it also means that there won't be a dedicated Q&A episode I will answer the few questions that I did get in an upcoming episode 
And with all of those logistics out of the way, let's finish up with another five-star review from one of you amazing listeners. They mean the whole world to me. So if you feel like leaving me a five-star review on Spotify or a or five-star rating rather on Spotify or a review on Apple, please do. I might just read it here. This one actually came via my agent who saw it on Apple and had to read it out loud to me because it was so nice and she was so touched even just reading it from afar. It's from a user called Alice Saw in the United States and it says, my all-time favorite podcast. I am so, so late in writing this review, but I've somewhat recently discovered this podcast and I'm absolutely obsessed. I've been binging it constantly. The episodes are just super entertaining. You can tell how much effort Liv puts into the researching, the content, and her commentary is absolutely hilarious. I love how much of an ally she is to the LGBTQ plus community and how she isn't afraid to talk about sexism, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, and rape culture, among other issues, in her episodes. She uses her platform to spread awareness to important topics and is honestly super cool. You'll want to be her friend. I do. You're missing out if you don't listen to her podcast. Thank you so much. I have so much trouble reading such praise out loud, but also I love it so much and I think it makes you all want to leave me more reviews. So I do it. Uh, but I am awkward. Thank you all. <laughs> Let's talk about Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians. I honestly could not have done this series without her. I cannot say it enough. The research, the script writing in a lot of cases, just she helped me so immensely. I Michaela is the best. The podcast is hosted and monetized by iHeartMedia. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron, where you'll get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. Honestly, you are all the best. Oof, this is cool. I am ready to go back to mythology, but gods, I loved learning about Sparta, and I hope you all agree. Thank you for listening. I am Liv, and I love this shit. Mm -hmm.